Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and we're going to continue our discussion about Harlan County history with Dr. James Green. Okay, so we're finally getting up to the actual settlement of Harlan County. Yeah. Uh, so the people who the largely the people who first settled Harlan County uh, came from Southwest Virginia. There were a few who worked their way up from North Carolina. And of course, back then, North Carolina included part of what is now Tennessee. Uh, but uh, there were people who came from, you know, Daniel Boone was from down in North Carolina. And there were people from that same area that worked their way up into Harlan County. Uh, uh, but but the majority of the people had worked their way across Virginia over the past century, you might say, or, or the past 50 years, depending on how recently they had immigrated to America. And so at the time that the settlement of Harlan County began, a lot of these people were living, if you drew a, a sort of a, a an arc from Kingsport uh, up to the... Um, current Virginia state line. And uh, if you drew it there and then you just went west of that in that territory, a lot of the people were living in that territory. So they were living in what is now uh, Scott County and Lee County and Wise County and so forth. Uh, and so you can go look at the tax list and you can see the names of these people in the early, in the 1780s and early 1790s living over there. And then when you, then all of a sudden, in the 1790s, they begin to cross the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, and there are there are there are some tricky things about trying to reconstruct this from records because the tax lists are a really good record to kind of help you know that where somebody might have been. Except that if you own property, you didn't necessarily have to live there on that property, uh, so that doesn't always work. <laughs> but most of the time, you did. But anyway, but. Uh, we know one of the, the um, early settlers in Harlan County, probably about 1795, uh, was a couple named William and Susanna Turner, and they were from over in Virginia. And they, uh, their daughter, Susanna, was uh, allegedly the first white child to be born in Harlan County uh, mm -hmm. in 1795. Uh, and the, the DAR determined that they thought that was an accurate story. So, uh, but... There is a little confusion there because uh, Susanna Turner's father was Carr Bailey, and Carr Bailey also did come to Harlan County. And there are different uh, versions of that. Uh, and what is kind of puzzling to me is that in looking at the tax list, that I don't really see any evidence of him showing up on a tax list in Kentucky until uh, two or three years into the 19th century. So I'm not totally sure whether he he came until a little bit later, but his son and his, his other son-in-law, George Britton, who married his daughter, Mary, uh, was also one of the early settlers of Harlan County, probably by 1797. And then a guy named Samuel Howard and his wife, Chloe, uh, moved into Harlan County around 1796. And those are generally people that are thought of as the first settlers. However, there are never other people. If you start looking real close at the tax list and you, and you look at who was in Knox County, uh, in the 1800 census, uh, which Harlan at that point was in Knox County. So if you start looking at all that, there's a number of other people. There were Blantons and there were uh, Smiths and there were Joneses and How uh, there were a bunch of Howards. There's not, Samuel Howard is one, one branch of Howard, but there's another branch of Howards. So there's a number of different people that within that little time sp span, let's say between 1795 and 1805, that, that showed up. 
Um, and so uh, well, so it's, it's hard to say for it. You know, you you really when you say the first settlers, we can't say definitively this is absolutely the first settler. Um, so real quickly, when was Harlan County? What year did Harlan County become a county? Well, Harlan County became a county in 1819. And it's uh, the lineage of Harlan County actually goes back to, uh, you know, Pencastle County, Virginia, which then became Kentucky County, which then became Lincoln County, which took in a huge part of southeastern Kentucky. And then uh, by 1800, there were enough people in the southeastern corner of Lincoln County that people wanted to have their own county. They didn't want to go to Stanford. That was a, that, and that was a pretty good ride. Yeah. So uh, they created Knox County. And by that point, uh, you know, there were there were several people that li were living in what is became Harlan County. So uh, George Britton, for example, became one of the first justices of the peace of Knox County in 1800. So then um, by 1819, there were enough people living in the um, heart, what is now Harlan and Bell County, part of Knox County, that they wanted to have their own county before, so they could get to the county seat easier. They didn't, yeah. they didn't like having to go down to Barberville. Uh, so there was a, a petition filed with the legislature in the, uh, December 1818 to, uh, create a, uh, new county out of part of Knox County. And then, uh, within about a week, there was a petition not to do that. <laughs> so that not everyone was on board with this petition, but the legislature passed the bill. And so, uh, on April 1st, 1819, Harlan County came into being. However, some of the people, evidently there was some dissension because the apparently the people who were appointed by the governor hesitated to do anything, and so they did not actually organize the county the way they were supposed to. And so the legislature that winter passed a new law that said, uh, you are supposed to uh, do what we told you to do. <laughs> you can go in there and organize the county, basically. Uh, and it was interesting, too, because... Originally, the boundary of Harlan County uh, ran from uh, the Knox County line by across the mouth of Straight Creek, which would be Pineville, and down to the Cumberland Gap. And then in this second bill, they, they advanced the county line five miles west of Cumberland Gap. So that was the greatest extent of Harlan County's uh, territory. But uh, that was cut, cut back a few years later. I think that there were some people probably... Uh, uh, down there in that general area uh, near the Gap who did not like the idea of leaving Knox County. They like being in Knox County. But anyway, um, so in 1819, uh, the county was created, but it was not until 1820 that they organized. They got together, the guys that were the justices of the peace, and they decided that the site of what is now Harlan would be the county seat. At that time, because of the Indian Mount, it was a very beautiful looking place, the valley. And uh, Collins history says that there were these tall walnut trees growing there on the on the mound and all this. And they wanted to have their courthouse up, you know, elevated where it would be. Everybody could see it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and my grandfather talked to an old timer uh, when he was young about this. And they had two or three different places that they considered. But this was also the place that if you lived on any one of the three main forks, the Cumberland River, or if you live just downriver, you had to go past this this site to get to any of the other forks. So it was a very logical place to put the mm -hmm. county. And so uh, so they laid out, laid out a town with two with two streets, uh, and it was very small, and it remained very small until the latter part of the nineteenth century. And, and it didn't really grow that much until actually till the coming of the coal industry. But yeah, it was known yeah. as Mount Pleasant. However. Uh, there was already Mount Pleasant Post Office. Oh. So the post, the postal service, such as it was back then, said you have to, we're going, you have to call this place Harlan Courthouse. So <laughs> letters were sent to Harlan C H. Uh, oh, and and so Harlan had two names throughout the the nineteenth century. He basically, had two names. Oh wow! So they used Mount Pleasant, but they also, and when it was incorporated in the eighteen eighties, the the name of the town was Mount Pleasant in the incorporation. So in 1912, after the railroad came and they were thinking about the coal boom and what was going to happen, uh, they decided that, well, first of all, Harlan County got, I mean, Harlan, the city of Harlan got changed to a fourth class city. 
but they also decided that they wanted a better name that sounded, they didn't want one that sounded sort of bucolic and rural. They wanted one that sounded serious business. <laughs> so that, and everybody was already calling it Harlan. So that's how it, how it became Harlan. Now, another thing the same way with Cumberland, Cumberland started off the settlement uh, that became Cumberland was known as Poor Fork. Oh. And when it was incorporated in 1911, it was called Poor Fork. But at some point in the 20s, they went in and got the name changed to Cumberland. So oh. uh, it's really, you know, <laughs> there's business, there's commercial and tourist aspects to a lot of the decisions we make about things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Which that's, that's pretty interesting. You don't find too many uh, counties that are being named. And when they go to form the county seat, they actually create the the, the town, you know, the town wasn't, wasn't there te technically the before town. the county. Yeah. Samuel Howard and uh, I think it was his brother uh, owned property there and they sold, they sold 12 acres to the uh, county. And so this was the corner of what is now Clover and Main Street. Uh, and that was where the first three courthouses of the county were located. But then in the 1880s, they decided uh, that they wanted to expand the town. And so they uh, created a new public square that was where the present courthouse is located, which is uh, actually more, uh, in, to uh, my thinking, is more the center of the town now mm. than, it would, than it was then. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, but they, we've had a total of five courthouses plus the Justice Center. Oh, wow. In the history wow. of the county. The first courthouse was log. The second one was brick that they made the brick right there because they didn't have any way to haul brick in. And then after the civil war, it was burning the civil war. So after the civil war, they built a frame courthouse because they had to have a courthouse. And then they decided to get rid of the frame courthouse and move the courthouse. And they built a brick courthouse. And then in the 1922, they uh, replaced it with a um, um, Bedford limestone courthouse, which is oh. the, the present courthouse. Yeah. And the, the Justice Center then is just on down from the the courthouse. The old, the, so we have the two buildings are in the, basically occupy the same block. Of the, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's that's one of the questions I always seem to ask about um, when we're talking about county histories is, did the courthouse burn? <laughs> and most of the time it's it's a yes, and most of the time it's a yes during the Civil War. Uh, that's a yeah, well, during the Civil War, apparently, uh, there's two different stories about this. But uh, the the official story, which is on the historical marker, is that it was burned by people from Lee County, Virginia, in retaliation for the burning by the Lee County, Virginia courthouse by uh, Union troops. Mm -hmm. But there's also a story that the courthouse was actually burned by a bunch of uh, local uh I guess just irregular. They weren't really actually soldiers. Uh, all they claimed to be soldiers uh, who are pretty much maybe almost outlaws. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but, but anyway, it's a, it's a colorful story. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the thing was though, now when you say the courthouse, the courthouse until after the civil war, the first two courthouses, the clerk's office and the jail were separate buildings. So that when they burn the courthouse, they also, I think they burn the, the uh, clerk's office so that, but they did not burn the jail uh, apparently. But anyway, so there were some documents lost because the documents were not kept in the courthouse. They were kept in the clerk's office. Oh, but I don't yeah. think there were, whole, I mean, we have most of the, what I would consider to be the records from that time period. The only thing we don't seem to have is the first, if there was an order book between 1820 and 1829, we've never, nobody's ever seen it. Yeah. In, in modern times. So I don't know if there was one it was burned or if there just wasn't one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about like, and we were talking about the first settlers or first permanent settlements there um, and they're, you know, I, I, it's pretty amazing that though, that they're building, especially that first decade from 19, 1820 to say 1830, that probably wasn't necessarily the main focus, you know, let's just you know, build this town and stuff. Um, well, like they lighted the town off in lots and they apparently, I've never been able to completely document this, but apparently they had an auction so that a number of the town lots were sold at auction. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were also continually throughout the 18, uh, the first the 1820s, they were actually 
uh, from time to time, the court would sell a lot to somebody. So I don't think they were, they were not all bought at auction uh, yeah. initially, but it, it, that's kind of interesting. And then uh, in uh, the 1880s, the guy who owned all the property adjacent to the town itself, as it laid out, died and his estate arranged to have it to, uh, subdivided into streets and lots and the county agreed to buy part of it uh to kind of uh expand the town so oh. uh, and then then uh, we had a land company come in and buy up what's now known as ivy hill uh i mean they got out their hands on that and they so at the beginning of the 20th century they were dividing all that up into lots and selling that so there are a lot of little subdivisions that have been developed mm -hmm. in the in the town of harlan and of course, if you go, if you were to look at uh, Cumberland, there's probably similar kinds of things going on up there. Yeah, uh, most of the incorporated towns in Harlan County, though, are, are small compared to you know, well, to to, to Harlan. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's a different there's different kinds of history around each of those towns, but. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, like a lot of times, um, you know, people always talk about frontiersmen, and definitely even you know, I'm guilty of this as well. <clears throat> on the on the channel, you know, we talk about frontiersmen. When the states first getting settled, we talk about the Civil War a bunch, but that that in between time, so from like say, you know, becoming a county to the Civil War, what what was going on in Harlan County? Well, let's think about why people came to Harlan County. Uh, from some of the uh, research that has been done on migration into Kentucky, uh, you know, there is a there is an old story that the people that settled in the mountains just kind of ran out of steam, their wagons broke down or something, and they just, like, they were too sorry to move on. And that, and that has been told seriously in some places. Yeah. But actually, the evidence is that the people who came to the mountains initially were serious because, the, you know, everybody made a beeline for the bluegrass when they first came to Kentucky. So by the 1780s and the 1790s, that land, a lot of that land had been taken up. But they discovered there were these river bottoms, and most of the river bottoms were pretty good for farming. Mm -hmm. So, because nobody was settle, settling up on the mountainside, they were settling in the river bottoms. And so, you had land speculators in the 1780s, for example, that came into Harlan County and were taken up. They were getting land surveyed and getting land warrants and getting land surveyed, uh, even though they, a lot of them didn't settle on it. So, uh, people came though to Harlan County, I think initially they, they had the idea that. They were going to they were going to make a living in agriculture and exploitation of natural resources, and so the agriculture, of course, the principal agricultural crop in Harlan County was corn, which they ate or fed to livestock, mm -hmm. uh, and then they also, of course, raised things like beans and uh, a number of other vegetable items. But then, if they really wanted to make some money what they raised was livestock mm -hmm. because they could transport livestock because lands, frankly, as I used to tell my kids in the class, you know, a cow or a uh, pig can walk to market. <laughs> so you don't have to train. You didn't have to have a <laughs> truck to transport them. You didn't have to have a railroad to transport them, which yeah. coal cannot walk to market. So yeah. that's one reason that coal did not develop in the early years because there was no way to get it to market. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were raising, so there was a, there were some horses raised, uh, interestingly enough, even though Kentucky was a big mule producing state prior to the civil war, uh, there were very few mules, uh, produced in Harlan County. I mean, they just weren't raising mules. Uh, and this is based on the tax records, but they did, uh, produce beef cattle and they produced hogs. And there were guys who were, would go around and buy, the livestock and then herd the, the livestock uh, to uh, different locations. For example, uh, one of my great, great grandfathers uh, would take cattle to down to uh, Winchester for some reason. Mm -hmm. and he would also take uh, cattle over into Virginia as far as Lynchburg. So they had different markets where they would take the, the cattle and there, there were, and, and I've seen old uh, court records where, uh, there were there were guys that they, they were they were cattle dealers and there was they specialized in going around to everybody and saying, Have you got some cattle you want to sell me? And I will come around at a certain time and pick them up. 
uh, you know, and, and so we kind of had cattle drives. <laughs> Not like you see in the West, the Western movies, but <laughs> no. there were cattle drives and hog drives going on. <laughs> uh, so that was one of the that was one of the things. Another thing you could do, and this actually brought people into the mountains before settlement, was the that ginseng was very important on the in, in the export market. Uh, with, you know, the Chinese, for example, were really interested in that. And there were there were places where that could be. So it was very valuable. Mm-hmm. So you had people come in that were hunting sang. And uh-huh. people living in Harlan County in the early years, a lot of them, if they wanted to make some money, would go out and dig sign. And I know some of my great grandparents, great great grandparents, did it also. Uh, mm-hmm. and so that, that that was a, that was an important thing. Also, honey was an important product, and beeswax, uh, and to some degree, wool. Uh, yeah. In other words, just raw wool. Uh, and, and they could what they would do lots of times with that kind of stuff is they would take it to the local store. There are two or three general stores in the County and the storekeeper then would give them credit towards whatever they wanted to buy in exchange for the product. And then they would ship the product off to Lexington or someplace. Gotcha. So that's, that's pretty much what was going on before the civil war. Now, when we think about this, of course, we think about the population when Harlan kind of became a County in uh, 1820, the uh, population was fairly young. Mm-hmm. And so it, because o- over half of the population was under 26. Wow. Uh, and so, the, of course, that meant there was a lot of kids uh, in that. But uh, gradually, uh, of course, it, it began to expand, but it did not grow really, really very dramatically until, until the coming of the coal industry. So, uh, you had, of course, in addition to white people, you also had an African American population, which was largely slaves. There were a few free free blacks in Harlan County uh, in every census uh, after the probably eighteen twenty uh, census forward, but the, but the majority of the the African Americans were uh, enslaved, and uh, but there were never a lot of whole, a whole lot of slaves. For example, at the time of the Civil War. Uh, the uh, people who were enslaved in Harlan County were only like two percent of the population. Yeah, uh, it's a very small number. So that, that I think the probably the most um, at that time I think were 127 people were enslaved in, in 1860 according to the census. Uh, but it varied, and the number of slave owners also varied because I think at one point there was as many as 30 people who owned slaves. Mm-hmm. But then uh, at the time of the Civil War, for example, were only 19. So, so what that, was the total population? Well, it's a population. I had that someplace here. Uh, let me see if I see that. Well, I thought I wrote that down. I don't really have the exact population. I think it's around 5,000 probably mm-hmm. or 6,000 at the time of the Civil War or something like that. So the actual number of people with a direct direct interest, so even a lot if they had 10 people in the family, if you have 19 slaveholders and you've got 10 people, that's 109 people. So <laughs> you really, the number of families with direct interest in slave, slaves was not very large. And I think there was a lot of diversity of opinion. Uh, I think there were people in Harlan County who were uh, opposed to slavery. And there were people who, who probably tolerated it. And then there were people, of course, who um, were in favor of it. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of, and that's when, when the Civil War broke out, you have a diver, diversity of opinion about what should happen, which is true of Kentucky. If, you know, Kentucky mm-hmm. really, uh, you know, they talk about, the, uh, used to use the phrase, the war between brothers and stuff. Well, in a way, it was really that in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so when, this, when it comes time for the Civil War, uh, in that election of 1860, uh, of course, you, you will call that there were actually four presidential candidates mm-hmm. because there was Lincoln, who was a Republican candidate. And of course, that was considered to be the most radical party. Uh, <laughs> and you had the Democrats that split. So you had the Northern Democrats who had Douglas and you had mm-hmm. the Southern Democrats who had John C. Breckinridge from Kentucky, who had been vice president. Yeah. And then you had a, a guy from Tennessee named John Bell, who was a uh, sort of a, a moderate a candidate who was whose platform was preserve the union. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was called the Constitutional Union Party, and actually, because Harlan County had a history of being largely Whig during the oh. century, they were largely Whig, 
and they were they were always the Whig Banner County. They were one of the top vote uh, uh, vote getting counties for the Whigs. In other words, whenever whoever the Whig candidate Whig candidate was for president or governor would could count on carrying a big big majority, like seventy or eighty percent of Harlan County mm-hmm. votes. So uh, because of that, and because Henry Clay, you know, had really worked and in his leadership of the Whig Party to promote the union and a nationalist vision of the country and mm-hmm. compromise, then then the Bell guy really pre appealed to Harlan County people. So in that election, the majority, uh, the sizable majority of Harlan County people voted for the constitutional union candidate. Oh, and wow. uh, I, then there was a, there was a noticeable min- a minority, but still that were for Breckenridge. And I'm not sure how many votes Douglas got, but Lincoln only got two. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now to tell you how this turns around in 1864, when Lincoln is running against the McClellan, uh, Lincoln carries Harlan County, about 80% of the votes in Harlan County went to, to Lincoln. Wow. wow. <laughs> and this, and, and at that point, Harlan County became a Republican County, which it remained until the New Deal. Uh-huh. When Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, as a result of the New Deal, uh, Harlan County gradually became Demo- the Democratic County for a long time. And in some recent years, it's gone back to being Republican County. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of floated back and forth. But, but, um, of course, the Civil War itself, there was a division of opinion among people and certain parts of the county, there was there was more of a concentration of pro-union and certain parts of the county, there was a concentration of, uh, I guess, not necessarily pro-Confederate, but but pro-South. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and, and of course, you got to remember that Harlan County was on the border between two warring countries. If you oh, want that's to right. That <laughs> that's right. So think about because you've got the Union, which Lincoln said at the beginning of the war that if if, if they lost Kentucky, they're going to lose the game. Because mm-hmm. uh, you remember that Kentucky, you know, has this natural border of the Ohio River, which is a major con- uh, conduit for commerce. Mm-hmm. And so both sides wanted Kentucky really badly, and uh, I won't read all the Kentucky history right now. But, <laughs> but that, but that, the fact that Kentucky remained in the Union uh, was really important in the, mm-hmm. the outcome of the Civil War. But Harlan County was on the border with Virginia, which was uh, this not only a, a key part of the Confederacy, but actually the capital of the Confederacy was located in Virginia. So uh, one of the Confederate generals who actually was from Kentucky originally, who was stationed in southwestern Virginia, uh, wrote a dispatch to, to uh, I think it was to Robert E. Lee or somebody. And he said he was fussing about the people in Harlan County in southwestern Virginia. He said they just go back and forth across the mountains and whatever they want to do. And it's like <laughs> he said he could he could do anything about it. And he was really <laughs> exasperated. He didn't want him. He was really exasperated for people from Southwest Virginia crossing over to Harlan County, but it went, it worked both ways. But an interesting thing about this is that particularly in East Tennessee, you know, East Tennessee had a very strong pro union set uh, sentiment, even though Tennessee seceded. Mm-hmm. And so, and this was particularly centered like around Knoxville in that area, but there were a number of people who escaped East Tennessee because they wanted to be in uh, Union territory, and a number of those people would come came through Harlan County. In other words, Harlan County, because that border, the, the border of, at that time ran down to the Cumberland Gap. So anywhere, anywhere uh, along and through there, you could cross. There were places you could cross through the mountains, and so there were a number of people crossing into uh, into Kentucky to uh, join the the Union forces, and then there were also a number of. Uh, black people who ran away, they took advantage of the, to uh, run away, who were mm-hmm. slaves, enslaved, who crossed through uh, Harlan County. And some of them got caught and put in jail because the, Kentucky still had slavery at that time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and technically speaking, you were supposed to, you know, if you a runaway slave appeared in your county, you were supposed to put them in jail and hold them for their owner. <laughs> so, but it's really interesting to think about all the, the flux of people in Harlan County during the war who were not from Harlan County. I mean, it, it was, you know, and uh, there was not a lot of real military action in Harlan County. They were, they had a group called the Home Guards, 
in the Harlan County Battalion that was supposed to protect the county. And then uh, in Virginia, there was a Confederate uh, regiment or whatever that was under this guy named Ben Cottle, who was originally from, I, I think, uh, probably Lester County. Uh, and so there was in the early part, the, latter, the latter, late part, rather, of 1862 and early part of 1863, they this uh, Coddles bunch in the Harlan County Battalion were constantly having little skirmishes, mainly in Harlan County, but some in Letcher and some in Southwest Virginia. Uh, the most important military action probably of the war that occurred, that Harlan County played a role in it all, was uh, in 1862 going into 1863 at the end of the year. Um, this guy named Samuel Carter from originally from East Tennessee organized the first cavalry raid of the, of the war that through, and it went through Harlan County. They came from uh, uh, Manchester and they crossed through Harlan County and then they raided the uh, East Tennessee railroad that ran uh, to Bristol in that area of, of, mm -hmm. of um, Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. And then they escaped back. They came back through Harlan County. Uh, and if this caused great turmoil among the Confederates, uh, and if you read the dispatches and stuff, I mean, they, they were seeing uh, the Yankees everywhere, you know, the Union <laughs> troops were here and they were there. <laughs> and then, then, of course, there was a great deal of hand wringing. How did you allow this to happen? How could they get in here? You know, how they, could they sneak in here and all this? But, uh, but there were really, the, the biggest problem that Harlan County suffered really was that the, but when, because troops held different, both sides held Cumberland Gap at different points. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of foraging uh, for supplies from the troops that were stationed at Cumberland Gap. There was also uh, some foraging going on from troops, from Confederate troops, particularly stationed in Southwest Virginia, who would cross over into Harlan County. So Harlan Countyans had to learn how to hide all their food mm -hmm. and their <laughs> livestock. Yeah. And so there were people who actually began raising their crops up on the top of the mountain so they would have a crop. Oh. Uh, which was something they had not done before. Yeah, so there were there, and of course, there were also people who took advantage. Some of these people in the home guards kind of took advantage of their authority to harass the neighbors that they didn't like. And uh, they, they, there were some people who raided people's property. And my great um, grandfather, when he was a boy, that his family um, suffered that kind of thing because. Uh, they were actually they were Democrats, but they were not slaveholders. And I don't I, I don't I don't think they were pro Southern, but mm -hmm. but they somebody didn't like them, so they raided their house and uh, stole a lot of their furniture and bedding and stuff. And uh, my great great grandmother had a purse that was in it's kind of like a little pocket that was tied around her waist, and she had some coins in that. And when she realized what was going on, this was at night. She uh, tossed the the bag with the coins into this little branch beside the house, and so I saved them. <laughs> but but now that's just that's typical. There were several incidents like that, not just that one incident. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of as a result, and it was really funny because my great aunt was telling me one day this telling this story, and of course she grew up in the eighteen seventies. Um, that's when she was born. And she was telling me, and she said, now that is so-and-so, was so-and-so's great uncle. And they, and they remembered, <laughs> they, did, they, they didn't forget this stuff. So you, after the war, you had some disagreements mm -hmm. that turned into, in some cases, to feud between the Dude. people. Well, we'll stop right there with, uh, you know, kind of the end of the Civil War. You, you touch on that, you know, the, I'm, Plenty of feuds after the Civil War. It definitely left its mark on Kentucky as a whole. Uh, but I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Green, for uh, joining us. Uh, anything else before we go? Well, I've just enjoyed this, this and uh, I, I look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do it again, and we'll pick up. And uh, we got it, you know, like we said, we got to get to that uh, Harlan County and, uh, you know, Old King Cove for sure. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll back. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks again for listening, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos 
dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.